believe it or not, this is a television, a big screen from about 1979. You would have been a rich kid on the block if you had this at home with its big 50 inch screen, weighs about 100 kilos. It would be a very impressive sight to behold. It's built by Mitsubishi, although it is marketed in Australia by AWA Thorne, who were a big player in the 70s on the Australian TV market. There it is in its full glory. You can now see the base of it, quite substantial. You might be wondering, well, how does this front projection business work? To start, we have the Fresnel lens. It's actually concaved rather than flat like modern rear projection televisions. There's our badging with Thorne AWA. Would have been Mitsubishi in Japan and probably America as well. You can see that there's some shenanigans going on with the cabinet here. It looks like that can move, which it does, but we'll take it one step at a time. There's a little control panel here. I'll open that up. There's a standby light. And inside we've got the mains on and off switch, channel up and down, and a picture button of some sort. That's for starters, that's just basic there. So this thing's front projection, so the image is actually projected onto that Fresnel lens from the front rather than from behind. So we undo this, we pull back this, this here, and there are the three, or three lenses behind those are the three CRTs, the red, the green, and the blue, red, green in the middle, and blue at the far edge. They, those three project that image out, which hits the mirror, then bounces from the mirror onto the Fresnel lens and gets dispersed into that Fresnel lens. Hence, we get the end result of the picture. You can see with this cabinet, there are a couple of struts. Keep it from falling any further than it is. Inside, we have some more contraptions. Now, I'm not sure what that panel is over there. It's, if it's a date, 4th of the 8th, 1965, it might very well just be a calendar of some sort. It's all mechanical rather than electronic. Don't know what that AFT there button is. There's a switch when this, when this panel, when this lid's opened up, it depresses off the switch, so it might be sort of a standby turn on of sorts. There's a hatch here with picture adjustments. There's the tuner for antenna for VHF, UHF. And then there's some adjustments that can be made. Now, interestingly, at the bottom, there's a test off, on. I believe this thing actually has a built-in test pattern, which is very cool. There's more relating to that on the back of the television. Green position vertical, green position horizontal, red, blue position horizontal, red, blue position vertical. Color, tone, V-hold. Is that AFT again? Don't know if that's a bit of English. B level, should be B level perhaps. I don't know, but it could be a bit of English hitting us there. But it doesn't end. It doesn't end just yet. There's still another dreaded panel. Now, it's not really dreaded, but it does make me wonder that over here, there's a whole bunch of more adjustments. These would be more geared towards the professional G skewer. Oh, I can't even read them from here, but there's several of them taped up like the previous owners decided, no, we're not going to adjust those ones. It does make me wonder if this thing needs regular maintenance, regular adjustments, and that's for the consumer end of business too. It's not like it's hidden inside. There's no service menu. I doubt this thing will have any on-screen display. Moving around to the side, not too much to report on the sides. Wood veneer finish. Good match for the Atari VCS. It's the same around the other side. Let's have a look around the back. Moving in. Thorn. Did I not mention before the model number? Model 125. There's our AWA Thorn made in Japan. Warning, avoid scratches. Too late for that. Too late for that. This thing's copped a few scratches in its time. Moving down. There we go. Model 125. A few warnings there. Made in Japan again. And then over to the all important connections. Now you're probably wondering what the hell does this thing have being made in 1979? It's not too bad at first. I thought it was only RF. However, it's got a little bit more of that than that. It certainly doesn't have any RGB. So there's on the left side of the column, there's three, three antenna connection points. That top one looks like the modern style that we use now. In relation to the test pattern that I mentioned earlier, you can actually choose the pattern you want which is either across or across hatch. V 
very, very useful. Audio in, either in the RCA form or in the five pin DIN. Now, I doubt that this thing is stereo. It's got two speakers inside, but I doubt it's stereo back then. You can choose speaker, internal, external. So internal, we use the speakers inside the cabinet and external, you can plug a speaker into there and it looks like you can only put one into it. It's a bit lame, isn't it? But I suppose, again, it's only mono. Then there's the important video in. So I assume that's composite video. This right side here's got that RCA and then there's something I'm totally unfamiliar with. Some old school connector, big, big one with a metal thread on it to wind your cable, your plug onto that hardcore industrial size stuff there. So I'm glad we can put composite into it. I think it would only be PAL. I doubt there's any NTSC playback and I may test that. We do have a V-hold adjustment. We could lock onto the 60 Hertz, but we probably won't get color. Wow, this is stepping back in time looking at this. A couple of things that really strike me is the air cooling for the CRT. See the pipe up top and there's another one down bottom as well. You can see that one further in. The CRTs in projection televisions have to run quite bright to actually get an image that's bright enough for us to see at the end result. It's got to travel outside the tube, hit the mirror, then bounce up into the frontal lens. Needs to be bright, but because of that, it runs quite hot because it's running so bright, then it needs cooling. More modern units are liquid cooled. The face of the CRTs have a chamber on the front added, or not in the CRT, but added to cool it. And you'd see that in one of my past videos with taking out, taking things apart. You see there's the fluid inside. The other thing that's striking, although there's a lot of PCBs inside the unit, there's no actual proper or central chassis really, like a more modern design. It's a lot of smaller boards and there's very, very few chips that can be sided. Like there's one IC that's directly down there that you can see now, but that's about it. There's a lot of little sub boards all over the place. A couple of big speakers in the unit. It should have fairly decent loud sound with speakers of that size. If you want to know what brand the tubes are, they are Mitsubishi. You can see the diamond, the diamond pattern just. So we know they're Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi, no stranger to CRTs and rear projection, front projection televisions, showing their hand early on. That left tube's the red one, the middle one's the green, and the outside's the blue. Center one's green, as per usual. I think having the green gun or tube in the middle is the anchor tube, the anchor color, because the human eye can see green the best out of the three colors. That's what someone else told me, so I'm going with that theory as to why green is often the middle gun, middle tube in direct view and projection television systems. I wonder if that fan-induced cooling system, I'd say it'd be power. I don't know where it exactly draws the cool air or the outside air in, but quite a marvelous setup, isn't it? And there's your voltage your dials for the flyback transformers, I would say, unless it's focused, that's possible too. Oh yeah, there's even some, even some pots down on this board, but uh, screen, uh, screen voltage, drive, blue drive, green drive, cool stuff, very cool. We're getting near dusk. We're going to need it pretty dark to view the picture on the screen. I don't think it'll be that bright. I've got the power cable plugged into the power point, but I haven't turned it on yet. So there's going to be a few switches to turn on. We're going to film it. So if it blows up, at least it's on film. Oh, there's one switch on. I heard a, like a speaker thud, like it's got power. All right, so yeah, got a standby light, little red LEDs lit. What happens if I open it? We should get the test pattern on screen. Lift the hatch. This is like the nuclear code, the big red button. I'm gonna pull it up, the main switch. We should have action. Whoa! We've got volume. So we know the speakers work. We know it's partially working at least. But have we got image? Oh! Oh! You probably can't see that on camera. 
I can see a cross hatch, but it's only just visible. Change pattern to the cross. Yeah, the cross is there and it's, could be because it's on RF as well. It's interfering with RF, getting the jiggles, you know what I mean? That's sound external, internal. How do we get onto composite video? Let's go into this hatch. Test pattern off, snow, test pattern back on. Oh yeah, that's external, external video. But the test pattern's still present. Very hard to see though, very hard to see. Right, I'm gonna get the camera while we've got action. You're probably bored and let's get yeah. Stick it down there. See that? Oh, you see the cross hatch in the tubes. That's what it's projecting. We might have to wait till it's dark. Hey, look, we're having some success. It's blurry and misconverged as all shit, but we at least we've got a picture on the screen. At least we've got something going here. See how loud this is. Let me have a play with the volume. See how high I can go. That's full bore. So it's nothing extraordinary as far as sound's concerned, but completely adequate. We are outdoors, by the way, too. This is what it would be like if I took my glasses off to play on a CRT, you can barely see it. I reckon we can get some improvement. It might take a fair bit of tweaking, but surely we can get it a bit better than this. This is not really acceptable like this. Well, I've spent about 45 minutes maybe trying to tweak the screen. It's hard sitting on the left side, adjusting the pots. It's very hard to see the right side of the screen because it's a difficult screen to see. You really want to be in front of it where the camera is or a bit closer for best results, but I've done what I can. It's very, it's, the blacks are not black. They're sort of green and uh, the convergence is out as you go out further, which is of course part of the course for CRTs. Might just turn the carport light off and see if you can See if we can get that on the camera even better. Yeah, so at least um, I think we've made progress with it. It's, it's, it's still probably lacking a bit. I'd love if we could get it blacker, even over the convergence, but we'll just keep going along. Well, I've got to say I'm happy that the projector has stayed on for the whole time and the image has settled down. There's no real shakes with the NES on there. So it's definitely in a better state than it was to begin with. Though I can't say I'd like to be in the lounge room playing it like this exactly. It's not up there with more modern rear projections, but it is a little bit unfair on this unit considering really how old it is. Certainly gives us an idea of what it looks like. Let's have a go with the light gun on Duck Hunt. Oh yeah, that white flash is jumping the screen. Oh, here we go. Got bugs flying around on the screen, attracted to the light. Oh, oh yeah, oh yes. Shooting gallery. None of this 100 hertz nonsense. Pure raw analog signal. And the log. There we go. Blow the smoke away.
Check it out. Check the CRTs, RGB, mate. Strong and proud. I've got the Super Famicom hooked up. You can hear F0 playing. Signals NTSC composite. No color, of course. Even the screen is rolling. Good old fashioned V hold, however. Can fix that up. No color still, but we can grab onto that 60 hertz signal. I'm surprised how big the borders are at the bottom and the top. I know it's a little hard to see, but it's still daylight out here. However, this was just to show that it doesn't have NTSC support, which is absolutely no surprise. Remember how I mentioned before that the blacks weren't really very black, but somewhat green? I've got a PAL Super Nintendo hooked up via composite with 240p test suite on with this graph with this color bar scheme and you can see the green is overshot at the green and at the white where all the colors are combined as far as controls are concerned this picture knob that's here in the on off panel it might be just out of sight picture adjustment the one knob picture labeled picture seems to be a brightness an overall brightness so we can dial it back and the green doesn't overshoot as much but the picture will be dimmer you can actually feel the knob take its middle position. It's one of those clicky ones. And then we can overshoot even more and the green bleeds right out. This leads me to believe that I really need to have a good crack at adjusting the green around the back of the front projector to adjust whether it's screen voltage, drive or cutoff and try and get the green better. At least just the green, if nothing else. Bad news, the rain came about an hour ago. Nothing got wet, but I had to abandon the project, the recording and the TV being on. Now that I'm back and set it up again, turn it on, it's gone blurry as, and I haven't adjusted anything I was about to. So for now, it looks like that's the end. I hope you've enjoyed the video. At least we got a good chance to see it before it failed, like there's a, a focus fault that's blurring it out but unfortunately that's the way the cookie crumbles so thank you for watching and stay tuned for next time